in the last days of his life here on this earth, the Alter Rebbe reveals to his beloved grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek, and eventual successor, something that he had learned 50 years prior when he was a student of the Magid in Mezrich. He learned it from the son of the Magid named Reb Avram, otherwise known as the Malach. And it was that the approach that Hasidism takes to personal development and personal refinement, this is what the Alter Rebbe is revealing, literally in his last 48 hours here on this earth, revealing to his grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek, and he says, I want you to know something I learned when I was a student of the Magid 50 years ago. The entire Hasidic approach to self-refinement is based on the military strategy of Frederick the Great of Prussia during the Seven Years' War. That's tonight's presentation in one line. Now, in order to understand even a little bit of what that means, we're going to get into European history, we're going to get into military strategy, we're going to get into Kabbalah, we're getting into psychology. So if, uh, if you're ready to begin the journey, yeah? Okay. So let's take a look at the first slide. The first slide shows you where I began this journey. I began when I was studying a sicha of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the successor of the Alter Rebbe, seven generations later. In Chelek Tes Vav, that's volume 15 of Lekutei Sichas. There's a sicha, Parshas Vayishlach, and it's speaking about Yankov Avinu, our forefather Jacob, and how he prepared for his reunion with his brother Esau, Esau in English. So Yankov is preparing for his confrontation with Esau, and it says he did three things. He prepared a gift, you know, as a bribe. He prepared to fight prepared for war, and um, he davened, he prayed. And it's discussed over there how those three different ways of preparing represent chesed, gvura, and tiferes, which Kabbalistically are the three main emotional characteristics. And in a footnote, Ha'ara number 55 here, which I, I, I have the original page of the Lekutei Sichas, and I circled it in red, and then I magnified it here a little bit larger. Footnote 55. Um, the Rebbe refers to a few sources about this idea of Yankiv Avinu using all three emotional facets when he is confronting Asaph. And here's what the Ha'ada, here's what the footnote says. Ksav Yad Kodshe HaTzamech Tzedek, this is a manuscript, this is the holy handwriting of the Tzamech Tzedek, the third Chabad Rebbe, Netak Behatomim, which was copied, a facsimile of it appeared in Hatomim, we'll talk in a minute of what, what is Hatomim, Cheveres Gimel, volume three, okay, it gives it away that it's a magazine, we'll talk in a minute what kind of a magazine, when, where, what. Kuf Chof Aleph, page 120, folio A. And the Rebbe also gives a couple of other sources. He says, Ure'e Lukutei Teirev Eschanen, Davhei Omad Aleph, Lukutei Sichas Chof, Chelek Chof, Omad 407, Ve'elech. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's look at this. Let's uh, still show the slide here. Let's look at this source of the manuscript of the Tzemach Tzedek that appeared in Hatomim. First of all, what is Hatomim? It says here, Koivetz Hatomim. It means uh, a magazine. It was a magazine, or an academic journal, maybe more accurately. And it was published by the Lubavitcher Yeshiva in Poland after the Sixth 
Chabad Rebbe had to flee the Soviet Union. So they transplanted Lubavitch. Lubavitch is a town in White Russia, which became part of the Soviet Union. They transplanted Lubavitch into Poland. And you see here that it says in the, uh, in the, in the, in the the title here, where it says Koyvetz HaTamim, and then at the bottom, not the bottom, but the bottom of the, like the, uh, the bottom of the top, it, it says Be'ezus Hashem Yisbarich, with the help of Hashem, Varsha, Varsha means Warsaw, the city of Warsaw, that's where they published it, Chedish Nisan, Tov Resh Tzadik Vav, month of Nisan, meaning the springtime of 1936. So this was a magazine that was printed by the Lubavitch Yeshiva, and it was about Hasidic scholarship. And they put it out uh, during these years. Now, let's look, let's go to the next slide. This is the Ksav Yad Kodshay of the Tzemach Tzedek, the holy handwriting, which appeared there in that spring volume of 1936. This is the actual facsimile of the, the handwriting of the Tzemach Tzedek. And here's where our journey is really going to begin. We're going to look into this manuscript and we'll uh, take it apart, word by word, and try to understand a little bit what it's saying. Okay, so let's just begin with the beginning. And you'll see next to the manuscript, I wrote it out. It's very tiny, but I wrote it out in block letters, easier to read block letters. And I have each line of the block letters corresponding line for line with the manuscript so you can try to follow inside. Okay. Oid nida lefianiyaz daiti. I want to explain, according to my best understanding, what does it mean that Jacob gathered all the flocks? There's a story about Jacob was a shepherd. He gathered all the flocks. What's this talking about? Now, I should mention to you, as we, we mentioned earlier, that there is... Remember in that footnote in Lukut Sichas, it mentions Veschanan Daf Hey Omad Aleph from Lukut Torah. So that, that's this page right here. That's the page from Lukut Torah. Lukut Torah are my modem, our oral discourses delivered by the Al Rebbe that were uh, transcribed later after they're uh, being delivered. And over here he speaks about this idea more at length. Okay, but he doesn't give the, uh, the bombshell information of where it comes from. Here it just speaks about, in general, the idea of, of, of Yankiv is Tiferis, which is the middle uh, channel, and it, com it combines love and awe and transcends both of them, and it avoids problems that are symptomatic in the, when you compartmentalize each emotion, you, 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 you have certain inevitable issues that arise, but if you can have the middle path, which is Yankiv, so then you, you, you get the best of all worlds. I'm not going to get into that just yet, because we're going to get into that with Hashem's help. But let, let, let's continue here on the top line of the, of the manuscript. He says, I'm going to explain, according to my best understanding of what I, uh, what I heard, Alpi Hakdomas, or Hakdoma, Shemaiti mipe kodshe, according to an, a preface, let me, let me uh, give you an introduction, in accordance with what I heard from the holy mouth of Kveid Kedushas Ovi Admur, of my, uh, my father, meaning my grandfather, my Rebbe, Nishma Seiden, may his soul be in paradise, be Piena, in the village of Piena, and it seems to me, to my best recollection, beyem vav erev Shabbos Kedish on the sixth day of the week, meaning on Friday, erev Shabbos Kedish shlifnei. Next line, histal kusei. Okay, let, let, you can come back to me over here. I think we had the slides on for a long time, so uh, just the people who are watching on video should not continue hearing a disembodied voice. You understand what the Tzemach Tzedek just wrote. 
He says, I want to explain something to you. Where did I get it? In Piena. When did I get it? On Friday afternoon before the Alter Rebbe is passing. From whom did I get it? From the Alter Rebbe. You have to understand what this is saying here. The Alter Rebbe, we know, we mentioned at the beginning, his yard said is Chof Dalet Tevis. In the year of the Alter Rebbe's passing, Tov Kuf Ayin Gimel, which was still the secular year 1812. That day, the 24th day of Tevis, was on Matzah Shabbos, Saturday night, Sunday. And the Alter Rebbe passed away on Matzah Shabbos, on the evening following Shabbos. In fact, it's known the Alter Rebbe, normally we daven maidav, make avdallah, the, the Alter Rebbe made avdallah, he daven maidav, and passed away later that night. So the Tamech Tzedek is saying, this is what the Alter Rebbe told me on Erev Shabbos. So do the math. This is Yom Vav, this is the sixth day, not even the, the sixth night, meaning Thursday night, but this is Friday day, Friday day, then you have Shabbos, and then the, the night coming out of Shabbos, that's, that's the Histalkus, that's the Alter Rebbe's passing. So literally, we're, we're, we're within 36 to 48 hours from the Alter Rebbe's passing. And this is what he's talking about. I mean, we have to assume that this is important. This is important, and he's sharing it with his beloved grandson. Most of us know that the Tzemach Tzedek was raised by his grandfather because he was orphaned. His mother, Rebbe Tzemach Leah, passed away, and he was raised by his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, and eventually became his successor, not his direct successor, but after the, the Alter Rebbe's son, the Mitle Rebbe, and then the Mitle Rebbe was succeeded by the Tzemach Tzedek, so this is important stuff. We have to assume this is important stuff. And, and you, you caught the detail. He says where it happened. He says in Piena. What's Piena? Piena is a little village. The only reason I ever heard of Piena, and I told, some, I told a Ukrainian the other day, Piena, he says, well, it's, we don't pronounce it Piena. We call it, we pr I can't even do it with the Ukrainian accent. He said, we pronounce it Penye. I said, well, I don't know. And all, all the Hebrew and Yiddish manuscripts I see, it's, it's, it's spelled Piena. So I, I'll say Piena. But Piena is a little, there's nothing in Piena. Piena is the Alter Rebbe. Actually, <laughs> I will refer you to a recording from, I think, two years ago. I don't even think it was a year ago. We did, also Beishmul Chabad sponsored a Chavdal Tevis event where we did the biography of the Alter Rebbe and specifically focusing on the last days of the Alter Rebbe in his flight from Napoleon, which took place basically from the end of the summer of that year until a few months later, his eventual passing on, on this very night. So uh, I'll refer you to, uh, I guess you could go to soulwords.org and you could go find that class. Just use the, the search in soulwords.org and you search for uh, Alter Rebbe. And uh, there it gives a lot of detail about the Alter Rebbe's flight from Napoleon's armies. But at any rate, Napoleon was invading. Napoleon was sweeping across Europe and he was having unprecedented success. The Alter Rebbe opposed, we're not going to speak about this at length. Again, I refer you to last year's Chof Dalatev's class because there we spoke about this at length. But the Alter Rebbe opposed Napoleon, which was interesting because his colleagues, his other um, peers who were also students of the Magid in Mezrich, they supported Napoleon because Napoleon promised to liberate the Jews, to give equal rights, Obviously, Jews in Europe at that time were second-class citizens at best. Napoleon was promising to be a liberator. So uh, the other Talmide HaMagad, the other students of the Magad, were very much pro-Napoleon. The Al Rebbe said that if Napoleon's going to win, that it'll be materially beneficial, but it'll cause a, a, a massive assimilation, and uh, spiritually it'll be devastating. So he opposed Napoleon. So he was fleeing from the oncoming um, of French armies going deeper into the interior of Russia. And finally, where he passed away, he was in the village of Piena. So the Tzemach Tzedek is writing, he's setting the scene. It's Friday afternoon, he doesn't say afternoon, it says Friday day. It's Friday day, <laughs> what, Chov Beis Tevis, in Piena, it's 
36 hours approximately from the Al Rebbe's passing, and this is what the Al Rebbe is choosing to share with his beloved grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek. Okay, let's look back at the, at the Ksav Yad. Sha'amrli, that he told me, B'Shem Horav HaKodesh Reb Avram Ben HaMagid Nishma Se'edin Mimezrich. He told this to me in the name of Reb Avraham, also known as the Malach, who was the son of the Magid from Mezrich. Actually, pull up from the slide again. You can come back to me. The Magid, let's back up even further. The Baal Shem Tev had 60 official students. Shishim Gebeirim. The Magid was Pishnayim. He had double the amount of official students, 120. Now, obviously, both the Baal Tov and the Magid influenced tens of thousands of Jews in the region in their lifetimes. But I'm saying official students who studied directly with them, the Magid had 120 students, and these were the all-stars of Chassidus. Virtually every Hasidic dynasty is traced to one of these students of the Magid. One of them, of course, is the Alter Rebbe, who established the Chabad school of Hasidism. But uh, there were the greats, Reb Levi Yitzchak Berdichev, Reb Eli Melech, Reb Zosia, uh, the, who were both brothers, or another pair of brothers, was Reb, uh, Reb Shmelkem in Nicholsburg, and Reb Pinchas, the Balaflo, and on and on and on, the Chayze, and all, all, all the greats, all the greats. So one of these Talmidim was the son of the Magid, named Reb Avram. And Rabbi Avram had a nickname. They called him the Malach. And they called him the Malach for a reason. Because in Yiddish, we would call, we would call it Seflegenkeit. In English, you might call it absent-minded professor. And I, I don't mean that dismissively. The, 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 the Malach was a holy, holy, holy Jew. But he was so holy that he didn't really pay attention much to his physicality. And so they called him the angel. In fact, Many of you may know that the Magid has a famous aphorism that he said about physical health, about guarding your health, about a klein aloch and guf. A small hole in the body can make a big hole in the soul. The context of that aphorism was an instruction that the Magid said to his beloved son, to the Malach. He pleaded with him, take care of your health. And he, he just couldn't, he couldn't be brought down to this world to care about such things. It's interesting. The, the, the Alter Rebbe had three sons. We mentioned before that the Alter Rebbe's direct successor was the Mitler Rebbe, Reb Doivber, who was named after the Magad. The Magad's name was Reb Doivber. But uh, the, 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 the Alter Rebbe had another son, Reb Meisha, and then another son, Chaim Avram. Chaim Avram was named after the Malach, but the Alter Rebbe added the word Chaim. V'chai bohem, you should live, like, be like Avram, the Malach, but v'chai bohem, but live in this world. <laughs> Have a healthy body. So we called him Chayim Avraham. When, <clears throat> when the Alter Rebbe came to Mezrich, he was paired with the Malach as Chavrusas. It's actually interesting. We know that the, the Alter Rebbe, when he came to Mezrich, it was after a deliberation where he was already married at that time, he was 19 years old, and he was trying to decide if he should go to Vilna and study with the Vilna Gon, or if he should go to Mezrich and study with the Magid. And finally he concluded, he said, well, in Vilna they, they teach you how to learn, and in Mezrich they teach you how to daven, how to pray. So he says, I know how to learn. The Alter Rebbe, even before he came to Mezrich, was already a genius in, in, in Torah, in the revealed legalistic aspects of Torah, which also has something to do with the fact that later on, the Magad appointed him to write a Shulchan Aruch, a code of Jewish law. And later on also, when they used to debate with the opponents of Hasidism, and they, have, they would have to bring out their best guy to debate Talmudic arguments with the Misnagdim, so they would, the al Rebbe was, was their uh, ace in the hole for that. So he was, he was a gon and nigla, the Torah in the revealed legalistic Talmudic aspects of Torah already. So the, the, the Alter Rebbe said, since I already know how to learn, 
I'm not going to go to Vilna. I'm going to go to Mezrich and learn how to pray. So he came to Mezrich, and they paired him with the Malach. They were Chavrusas. They were study partners. And the Alter Rebbe would teach Nigla. He would teach Gemara to the Malach. And the Malach would teach Chassidus. The Malach was the Maggit's son. So he would teach Chassidus to the Alter Rebbe. And when the Alter Rebbe was enjoying the lesson so much that he didn't want them to finish, they had an agreement how long they would learn. They would take turns. So when the, the, the clock was ticking and it was almost the end of their, uh, of their Hasidic session, the Malach was so oblivious because he was so ecstatic in his, in his deep, spiritually sensitive uh, way that characterized him, the Malach. The Alter Rebbe used to get up and walk over and set the clock back <laughs> so he could steal a little bit more time of learning Chassidus with the Malach. The Malach actually, sometimes when he would learn Chassidus, he would have an out-of-body experience. And the Alter Rebbe used to uh, take him to the sink to wash Natili Sedayim, to, to the, the ritual washing of the hands, and then to, to eat, so, uh, they, they say, a buttered bagel. <laughs> that was a delicacy in uh, late 1700s uh, Poland. So that's a buttered bagel. And that would draw him back into his body. Okay, so at any rate, again, the Tzemach Tzedek is saying this was a day and a half before the Alter Rebbe's passing. The Alter Rebbe is revealing to me teachings that he learned from the Malach back in Mezrich. Oh, let me, let me show you a little bit. Um... You know what? Okay, let, let's go back to the let's let's go back to the slide here. Okay, so you have the slide. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're on uh, the, we're we're on the second line, and if you're looking at the actual manuscript, so on the second line there's a like a dash. A little bit more than halfway through the line, there's a dash. When I say a little bit more than halfway through, I'm I'm, I'm talking about right to left, because it's Hebrew. So. Uh, a little bit more than halfway through the second line. There's a dash, like a long hyphen. Okay, and then after that hyphen, it says, Next line, This is the Hasidic discourse that the aforementioned Avram the Malach came up with, innovated, Min hamilchama shahoya oz beyamov, from the war that was then in their days, hanikra, which was called Zibin Yoreke Krig, the Seven Years' War, that's in Yiddish, Bein Friedrich Melech Preisen, between Frederick the King of Prussia, Im Shore Amalochim, and the other kings. Okay, let's. Come back to me on the, on the video. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> so the Malach told the Alter Rebbe a Hasidic discourse that he based on the war that happened in their days, which was called the Zibin Yorika Krieg, the Seven Years' War, between Frederick the Great of Prussia and the other kings. Let, let's explain this. Um, Pull up the slide. So a little bit uh, of chronology here. The Alter Rebbe was born in 1745. The Seven Years' War took place, you want to guess how long it went on for? Who? Seven years? 100%, that's correct, yeah. Okay, give the man a prize. Seven Years' War lasted for seven years. Specifically from the year 1756 until the year 1763. So you see this was happening during the Alter Rebbe's childhood. It would have started when he was about 11 and it ended when he was about 18. Now, I mentioned earlier, I don't know <laughs> if people remember, I, I said that the Alter Rebbe deliberated whether he should go to Vilna or to Mezrich and he had permission from his wife, he was married already, and I mentioned an age. Do you remember what age I said? 19. So the Alter Rebbe was 19 when he came to Mezrich. Now the Seven Years' War ended when he was how old? 
18. Okay, so this was a year later. But I want to explain something to you. <clears throat> this was a couple of hundred years before the 24-hour news cycle. So this isn't like today where you wait an hour and the news changes. They didn't have that kind of technology. And news was news for a lot longer time. So that's first of all. That's first of all. Second of all, I want you to understand the Seven Years' War made major changes in the territorial boundaries of Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, where many, many, many Ashkenazic Jews lived. So you're talking about something that had a direct effect on Jews. I mean, these battles, many of them were being fought right next to Jewish communities. So for those two reasons, A, that the news didn't become old so fast, and B, it had direct effect on the lives of Jews, you could well imagine that even though the war ended a year ago, a year prior, when the Alter Rebbe arrived in Mezrich, the Seven Years' War was still very much on everybody's minds. It wasn't obscure. It wasn't like, oh, you remember that war, that seven... No, everyone knew the Seven Years' War. It was something everybody lived through and was affected by, and it was, it was a buzzword. It was current events. It was very much current events. So imagine now, the Alter Rebbe comes to Mezrich, and... The, ma the Malach, the son of the Magid, says to him, I want to tell you something spiritual that I learned from this war that just happened. And many of you probably know that one of the tenets, one of the fundamental teachings of Teres Abal Shemtev is as von alts was mezet and was mehert, everything you see, everything you hear is ashkacha pratis, and therefore... You have to take out, you have to extract from it some type of a lesson in serving Hashem. So that's not so surprising that the Malach is saying, hey, this thing happened, it's current events, and I can learn a spiritual uh, lesson from it. But I want to tell you something. It seems to be even more than that. It's more than just learning a lesson from it. I've been showing you the Ksav Yad from Hatomim that was printed in, in the Hatomim magazine. Unfortunately, I do not have the actual facsimile of another Ksav Yad. There's another Ksav Yad of the Tzemach Tzedek. I have not seen it, but I, I found it reprinted, not the facsimile of the actual hand, hand, handwritten uh, uh, manuscript, but the words, the words were rewritten in a safer, and much of this research, by the way, is based on the Sefer Migdal Oiz of Rav Yeshua Monshain, Oliver Shalom. And there, he brings from another Ksav Yad Kotche of the Tzemach Tzedek, which again, I, I don't have. Uh, can we pull up? Where is it? Uh, oh, here it is, here it is. Okay, I'm sorry, so this is from Migdal Oiz. This is from uh, Monshine Sefer. And uh, this, is, this is a Ksav Yad Koche of the Tzemach Tzedek. I just, I don't have that facsimile. I'm, I'm not even sure if it exists or where to find it. But there, the Tzemach Tzedek uses even more radical language, attributing this language to the Malach. And he uses the term, that the Malach said to the Alter Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe told the Tzemach Tzedek, and the Tzemach Tzedek wrote it down, that this was a Hasidic teaching that was innovated and revealed through, the, from above, from above, through, meaning from heaven, through the war that was in their days. So there in that manuscript, the language is even more powerful. The Malach is not just saying, I saw this current event and I tried to learn a lesson from it. He's actually saying, in some way, this spiritual lesson was delivered to us in the form of this war. Okay, so now, let me... Uh, let me look at this, okay. Seven Years' War. Let's talk a little bit about the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War was a European war. 
But in many ways, it was the First World War. Now you're going to say the First World War was fought in the early 1900s. How can you say there was a First World War in the late 1700s? So it wasn't called a world war, but it was a world war. And I'm going to explain to you why. And students of American history may have a penny drop in just a moment. Um, you see the belligerents here. That means the sides. So um, <clears throat> you have Great Britain on one side. And of course, if Great Britain's on one side, you have France. Great Britain and France always rivals on the other side. You have Prussia. What's Prussia? Prussia doesn't exist anymore. It's basically northern Germany uh, on one side, and their rivals, Austria, on the other side. Austro-Hungary, or the Holy Roman Empire, or the vestiges of that. And then <clears throat> you had Russia. Actually, it's funny. Russia changed sides during the war, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other story. Russia changed sides. The Tsar died, and they, they changed sides. <clears throat> So you see here who's fighting this war. But here's what I want to tell you. All of these European countries were colonial powers. They had empires. This is the world. All the pink zones are where fighting took place during the Seven Years' War. So when I say it was a world war, it really was. There was fighting on every inhabited continent on the earth except for Australia. I said, you can come back to me. I said that students of American history may have a penny drop in a moment. Um, do you know that General George Washington, later President George Washington, fought in the Seven Years' War? He was a general in the Seven Years' War. First of all, let me ask you, what side did he fight on? Which country did he fight for? He was, yeah, so he was a British colonist. He was a subject of the king. So he fought for Britain. Yeah, he was an English general. <laughs> Don't forget that all the founding fathers at one point, they were good uh, English subjects. So George Washington was an English general. Yeah. And where did he fight? Where, geographically, I'm saying, where did he fight in the Seven Years' War? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Good. Where are you from? You know, you're from Pennsylvania? No, I'm from Ohio. You're from Ohio. So you're nearby. And you probably know about Fort Duquesne in, in Pittsburgh, which is also Fort Pitt. And that was actually one of the battles of the Seven Years' War, except in North America, they called the North American Theater of the Seven Years' War the, anyone know? The French and Indian War. Yeah, good. Okay, you knew it. So the French and Indian War. And why did they call it that? Because that's what the British called it, because they were fighting the French and alliances of indigenous tribes, of native tribes, Indians, what they called, who, who were teamed up with the French fighting the Seven Years' War, but on North American soil. Yeah. So this was really a world war. This was big news. Big news. All right. So let's go back to the, actually, if you could pull, pull up the slide again. He mentioned Frederick the Great, so I'll just show you Frederick. This is Frederick the Great. We call him Frederick. <clears throat> In English, we say Frederick. I don't, I don't think he called himself Frederick. Frederick, is, he called himself Friedrich. You'll forgive my uh, poor German uh, pronunciation, but uh, in Yiddish, he's called Friedrich, which is similar to the German Friedrich. Friedrich is uh, also called uh, the Grosse, the Big, the Great. We call him Frederick the Great. Uh, they also had a nickname for him, Der Alte Fritz. I don't know if that was a nickname he was okay with or not, but that's what they called him, Der Alte Fritz. And officially, if you want to say his full name, it would be Friedrich Huenzulern. Huenzulern was the name of the Prussian royal family, sort of like the Habsburgs in Austria. So you have Hohenzollern from the Prussian kingdom. And they basically ruled until World War I. Yeah, and that's a whole other story. The real World War I. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, uh, 
Let's go back to the manuscript. Yeah. So he's saying that the Malach was teaching the Alter Rebbe spiritual lessons from the war that happened in their days called the Zibin Yorika Krieg, the Seven Years' War, between Friedrich, Frederick, and the other kings. Okay. So uh, look on the third line in the Hebrew. Well, it's the same both in the manuscript and in the block letters. But the third line in the manuscript, at the very end of the line, there's a hyphen. And then after the hyphen, there's the, you could probably make this out, the two letters, chof yod, ki, the word ki, because. Can you see that the last word on the third line, ki? OK. You saw all you have, you have the slide? OK, ki. Next line, fourth line. Seder mayrechas hamilchoma tomid. The way of waging war always, now he doesn't mean always like eternally, forever, but what he means is in that era, in that era when warfare was fought in that way, with muskets shooting at each other. There were other formations the way they used to fight before in little groups, but that's, that's not this era. This era they would have guns, and he's gonna, he's gonna describe the way they would form those lines and how those lines would interact with each other. Okay, so the way of waging war always, meaning in that era, was shemechalkim hachayel gimel chalokim. They would divide the army into three portions. Chelik echod be'emtza, one portion in the middle, v'nikre doifen ha'emtzoi, called the center, small and two flanks, right and left, right flank and left flank. Next line. And so ke'elu, ke'elu, like that. And so too with the opposing sides set up in three sections, just like that. Just like that. V'nilchomim elu, mul elu, and they would fight one against the other, literally one across from the other. Okay, so you could come up to me. So I want to explain something here. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in military history. Um, when I was researching this, I did call experts in military history, and they tried to the best of their ability to explain these things to me. Without a background, it's very hard to follow. But I'm going to tell you what I did understand. And I, and I spoke to a few experts. I spoke to a professor at West Point at the, the United States uh, Military Academy, the Army. And here's what I understood. You know, we, we ask ourselves, how come they would just line up, like basically like, like a football game? Like we have a line of scrimmage, and you have the offensive line, you have a defensive line. Like, why did they do that? Like, why follow those rules? Don't follow the rules. So you have to understand something. Unless you're fighting, like, guerrilla warfare, like the American colonists, where you're hiding behind trees, okay? But if you have a big army, a real army, a trained army, and you have real firepower, the only way to engage, it's not that they wanted to stand there like ducks in a row and get shot at. That was the only practical way to engage. You have to remember also, armies are not very mobile. See, <laughs> we, we think of it, oh, just take a left, take a right. You can't do that. It occurred to me after I started learning the, the, this subject, in chess, you know why pawns only go forward and backward? Because that's what it's really like in war. It's not like you can just you know, take a hairpin turn and start running. You're not very mobile. An army, I'm talking about a whole army, and these armies were massive. We're talking about tens of thousands of soldiers. And these battle lines were massive. They were miles long. So you, and there's, no, there's no way to communicate either. It's not like you can give new orders on the fly as things are going down. So basically, you could say march, <laughs> or you could say retreat. There's two directions. There's forward and there's backward. And all you get to do is really pick a direction. You can aim this way, aim that way, aim whatever you, wh way you want. Once you're going, you're going, and then you're just going to go, and you're going to shoot. You're going to shoot forward. Why are you going to shoot forward? One simple reason. You shoot this way, you're going to shoot your friend in the head. So you really can only go one way and shoot one way. And remember, those guns were not that accurate. We're not talking about snipers 
Okay, they're just spraying in the general forward direction. So what you have is massive armies lining up as lines, usually two lines, two deep, so one could reload while the other ones were shooting. Okay, and, and these, these, these thin but very, very, very wide, like shallow but very, very wide lines, uh, and they would just come as close as they could and then start shooting across from each other. And whoever has the least casualties at the end, they, they win. And that, that's how it was done. It wasn't done for fun. It was just that's, practically speaking, how else are you going to engage the enemy? So that's what war was. That's what it was. Now, Friedrich, or Frederick, had an innovation. And the Temer Tzedek calls it an, an innovation. He calls it a stroke of brilliance. And this, too, I asked the military historians. And by the way, when I called the mili military historians and I asked them about this, the Tamakh Tzedek doesn't mention the name of the battle, but specifically, if this is known to every military historian, the name of the, of the battle is called Leuten. Leuten. Leuten is a Polish town with a German name. <laughs> it's spelled L-E-U-T-H-E-N. It's pronounced Leuten. So the battle is the Battle of Leuten, and it's a famous, miraculous victory of the Prussians, led by Frederick, over the Austrians, when they were outnumbered two to one, roughly two to one. There were about 30,000 Prussians and about 60,000 Austrians. Can you imagine the numbers we're talking about? Go to, go to like a, a baseball stadium. Think about the capacity of a, of a baseball stadium. You know, go to, go to Yankee Stadium. What's the capacity of Yankee Stadium? Anyone know? Huh? 55,000. Okay, so the Austrian army would have overflowed Yankee Stadium. Just the army, okay? And then you had the, the Prussians. So we're talking about massive numbers of people and also... The point I'm making to you is that the Prussians were massively outnumbered by the, by the Austrians. So it was not a battle that they had a very high likelihood of winning, except for the military brilliance of Frederick, which, as I was about to remark, is still studied to this day. And when I called military historians about it, they said, oh yeah, Frederick at Leuten, we study this till this day. It's a brilliant maneuver. And I said, oh, the Tzemach Tzedek thought so too. <laughs> he also thought it was a brilliant maneuver. Okay, well, let, let, let's, let's look here. Let's go back to the Xaviad. All right. V'hatzlochas Friedrich. We're in the middle of one, two, three, four, five. I think the fifth line. In the middle of the fifth line, there's a little hyphen. And after that hyphen, it says V'hatzlochas Friedrich. Okay. V'hatzlochas Friedrich. The success of Frederick. Oz, then, at that time. Al Yedei was through what? Shinishakim. I told you, he called it a stroke of brilliance. Shinishakim means that he was full, he was filled with wisdom. He had a, a brilliant, innovative, creative thought. And, and I'm going to explain to you in a minute, because I asked the military historians, what's so brilliant about this? And I'll explain a little bit. Okay. Vinishakim, he got smart. He wised up. She said that a call Gimel Machane Shalai that he set up all three of his sections. Remember, they used to do right, left, and center. They used to spread them out. You have to, uh, you'd have a right flank, a left flank, and a center. So, what did he do? He took all three of his sections, Shalai, of his. Neged machne vechelik echad shel haseine against one third, one portion of the enemy. So remember, there's 60,000 Prussians, 20,000 roughly, let's pretend. They weren't really equally divided, but let's pretend 20,000 in each section. And you take the whole uh, 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 Austrians, you have 60,000 Austrians, so divide them into three sections. So pretend 20,000. That's, it wasn't really that, but 20,000 Austrians in each section, and now the Prussians have 30,000. So, <laughs> if you take the whole Prussian army against a third of the Austrian army, now the Prussians have them outnumbered. So he took all three of his sections against one section of 
the enemy, meaning the Austrians. Vizehu, is that where we are? No. Gimel shel b'amnacher v'chelik echad shel haseni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vizehu, and this is this approach or this strategy. This strategy hanikra is what is called atakirin. Atakirin, similar to the English word attack or attack. Atakir. It's called atakirin. That type of strategy. I'll show you something interesting. There's a, yeah, there's a mimer of the Tzemach Tzedek in Torah, in, in Oyer HaTorah. Oyer HaTorah are the Tzemach Tzedek's own maimarim. And uh, so this is from Drushim L'Rosh Hashanah, discourses on, on Rosh Hashanah. And over there, I, you see it's highlighted, the word atakirin. He mentions very, very briefly in passing this concept of atakirin, but he doesn't explain it. He doesn't explain it. But over here, let's go back to the Ksav Yad Kodshe. He explains what Atakirin is. It's this approach where you take all three of your groups and gang them up on one of the enemy's three groups at a time. Okay, let's continue here. So he takes all three. Uh, this is called Atakirin. Yeah. Yeah. Right after the word atakirin. Kevin shakol gimel machne shaloi, misaba vim machne echot shell, next line hasayne. All three of his sections are now surrounding, encompassing one section of the enemy. The al yedeze, that through this, misgaber bevadai, they certainly prevail because now they have superior numbers. Aleho on them, over them. Va'achar kach, and then afterwards, Yasakain l'machna base, shall I say? Then they gobble up the second portion of the enemy, Vichain l'gimel, and then the third, Ad kalaisum, until they finish them all off. Okay, come back to me. So I asked the military historians, Vinis Chakim, this was so brilliant. I, I could think of that. I mean, <laughs> if if you put me in a position <laughs> where I had to come up with a battle strategy, I think that would have been one of my ideas. Why not? Why do I have to wait? And why do I have to play fair? Let me gang up on one section at a time. So it was explained to me. Everybody wanted to do that. <laughs> Everybody wanted to do that. <laughs> Go ahead and try it. It's not so simple. It's not so simple. How are you going to get the other side to play along? How are you going to let, get them to let you do that? That's first of all. So you have to have some type of a ruse. You have to have some type of a trick. Second of all, even if you trick them, it's not so easy because, and this is what was explained to me. I told you before, armies really, they just go one direction, front and back. Okay, imagine driving a box truck down the service lane of Eastern Parkway. Okay? You don't have a lot of mobility. You're not exactly a ballerina. Okay? You basically forward and backward, and even backward is, is a nightmare. You just want to just move forward. Okay. So it's not so simple to say, I'm going to maneuver in, and we're going to gobble up. We're going to come in, boom, and grab one section, and then we're going to pivot, and we're going to grab the next section, and then wherever the other section is, we're going to pivot over there and get them. It's not so simple. And remember, if you turn, you're, to you're totally exposed, because you can only shoot forward. You can't shoot sideways. You'll shoot your friend. <laughs> so you really, the only safe way to move and the only practical way to move these tens of thousands of people at a time is forward. So everybody wanted to do this. Everybody, of course, thought, oh, I wish I could just gang up on one of their sections at a time. But practically speaking, to pull it off, you had to be a genius. And that's why Frederick's strategy at Leuton is studied until this day. So let's talk about what he did, how he did it. I mean, the Tzemach Tzedek says what he did, but let's talk a little bit about what he did. Okay, let's pull up the slide again. Um, this is a map of the Battle of Leuton. And uh, you can kind of see the red is the Austrians and the blue is the, the Prussians. 
And you, you can kind of see how there are more Austrians than Prussians, although it's not that clear from this map. But you can definitely see how the Prussians are coming from the side. That you can see. And you can kind of see their path. I don't know, it's uh, very light, but there's these blue lines. And you see that sharp turn that they take? See, Frederick had, <laughs> see, Chabad, we're Russian Jews, but we know about Yekes, okay? You know about Yekes, German Jews, right? So German Jews are very punctilious. They're very, uh, you know, about the Yeke, he told his wife, he said, I'm going to be home a little bit late for dinner tonight because tonight's the, the night that we, we switch from Vesein Bracha to Vesein Talumata Levracha. So I'll be a little bit later for dinner, right? And they say, what, hap what happens when a, when a Chabad Chassid marries a Yeke? You have a Chuppah that starts exactly three hours late. So the yek is the German Jews, where did they get that from? They got that from German culture, okay? So Frederick had something, he had the advantage of, of the Prussians, of these German soldiers. A lot of them were mercenaries, Hessians, who the, the, the actually would fight for any side. Uh, they, they fought for the British during the Revolutionary War, what we call the Revolutionary War in America. Anyway, so he had these really well-drilled, really well-trained uh, German soldiers, and they could do these maneuvers. They could make these, these uh, sharp turns. So you can kind of see what's happening here. Now, I just want to show you one more slide. Oh, here's some images. These are obviously artistic renderings that were, <laughs> I don't think someone was sitting with an easel in the middle of the battle. This was done later on, but these are artistic drawings of the Battle of Leuten. Okay, so I just want to show you, this is, this is Leuten. <laughs> This field here is the battlefield. I don't know when it was taken, but it's a, it's a recent picture. There's nothing there, just a bunch of grass. So um, that's Leuten. That's where the battle was fought. It's the, the, the closest city. Leuten's not a city. The closest big population center is actually a town in Yiddish we call Breslov uh, in Poland. And uh, actually, I spoke to a, a professor. <clears throat> I spoke to a lot of professors when I was researching this. I spoke to a professor of, <clears throat> of European history. And he actually was at the university in Breslov. And he said, oh, Leuten, that's like 10 miles from me. I'll, uh, I'm going to go drive there and go take a look at it. That's not the picture that he took. This is the picture from, uh, from Wikipedia. <clears throat> but you see here, it's a big field. So OK, so come back to me. What did, what did Frederick do? Frederick, he had to fool the, the Austrians. So what he did is he had a bunch of decoys. You know what a decoy is? A decoy is a distraction, or sometimes they call it a feint, F-E-I-N-T. Like you pretend you're going to go to one side and you know, like a Michael Jordan head fake, right? You pretend you're going to, and then you drive to the basket that way. I'm from Chicago, so it's called Michael Jordan head fake. Okay, so at any rate, he had a decoy. He had a few chevre pop over the horizon. Let, let's pull it up. I can show the slide again, okay? It's not a very hilly area, but I don't know how long that visibility is, <clears throat> but uh, let's say it's a mile or so, and then after that, there's a, there's a ridge. And you can, you can hide behind that and then just pop up over the horizon. So come back to me. So what did he do? He had a few soldiers, enough soldiers to make it look like it was an army, pop up over the horizon first on the Austrians' right side. OK, so they said, that's where the Prussians are. And they would have no reason to doubt that, because remember, that's how militaries engaged. So they understood from that. That's where they're coming. That's where their lines are. OK, so that's where the football field is going to be. That's where the line of scrimmage is going to be. Let's get ready. Now, what really happened, let's uh, pull up uh, the slide again. They came around the other side. They came around to the left flank of the Austrians, 
with their entire army, the entire Prussian army, all 30,000 odd Prussian soldiers came around to the left side of the Austrians, to the left Austrian flank, and gobbled up that entire flank by itself. And you can kind of see that in the map. Come back to me. So I want to explain something to you. You're going to say to me, I don't get it. How long did the trick work for? So everyone just turn around and come running. First of all, what kind of communication do you think they had? You think they had radios? All you could do at that point is scream, and now guns are going off. Second of all, even if you could communicate, maybe like a flag or something, uh, what knowledge did they have? <laughs> what knowledge? Do you think they had aerial photographs? They didn't know what was going on until it was happening. And remember, I told you, these lines were miles long, like 10 miles long. Imagine, can you imagine that? We're here in Crown Heights. Just try to wrap your mind around it. Imagine a battle line that is going all the way th from here all the way to, to JFK. Okay, and that's the battle line if you're including all three, all three sections. So some guys in JFK, without a cell phone, are going to know, help me, we're outnumbered over here in Brooklyn. It ain't happening. And guns are going off. This is a realistic scene for Brooklyn, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't even know. And then add to it another factor. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to turn? I told you already. They can't turn. You're saying, why can't they just turn? Just turn. One guy can turn. You have thousands of guys. You have an army. You're trying to move an army. And you're trying to move them in the same direction. Remember this also. I don't think we relate to this adequately. You have thousands of men. It's very important. Again, it's not just to be fancy to go marching like this. That wasn't just to look cool. There's a reason for that. You know what the biggest reason for it is? People start running at different speeds in a little bit different directions. People are scared. They get disoriented. At that point, they don't know which way they're going. And then you're completely sitting ducks. So marching has a vital, absolutely essential reason behind it so that you know which direction you're going. So it was not so simple all of a sudden to take the Austrian army and goes, guys, just turn 90 degrees and run down the line miles. Oh, and by the way, while you're running, you can't shoot or you'll shoot your friend in the back of the head. So while you're running, you're defenseless. So that was the brilliance. That was the brilliance of Frederick. And he gobbled up all three of the Austrian sections, first the left side, then the center, then the right, until they were completely wiped out. So that's what happened. All right, let's go back to the Ksav Yad Kodshe. So now you're, you're wondering, like, okay, this is cool. But uh, I almost forgot that this was something the Al Rebbe told the Tzemach Tzedek 36 hours or less before his passing, something he shared with his dear grandson in the name of his dear study partner and said that this is a spiritual lesson. And a spiritual lesson of the type that was important enough that this was one of the last things that the Alter Rebbe even told the Tzemach Tzedek. So, okay, we got the European history lesson. We got the military, a little bit of the military uh, history lesson. What's the spiritual lesson? So let's, let's look here. Uh, um, so where did we get up to? Vo'inyin, yeah. Vo'inyin. Uh, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines down, almost the center uh, line, seven lines down. 
After the dash, it says, Vahoinyin. You see where it says, Vahoinyin? Toward the end of the lines, after a hyphen. Vahoinyin. Those who are following in the manuscript can see it. No? Seven lines down, toward the end of the line, after the hyphen, and there's the word, Vahoinyin. Vahoinyin means, and the idea. In this case, the spiritual idea. And we said already that in this manuscript, it sounds more like a lesson that he took from it, but in other manuscripts, it's actually saying that this is the way that this spiritual lesson came to the world. Here's the concept. Next line. Horav HaKodesh Reb Avram Zal. The concept that the holy rabbi, Rabbi Avram, may his memory be a blessing, extracted Ba'avedus Hashem in terms of the service of God. Shehi milchemes hayetzer, which the service of God is sometimes also called a war. It's called milchemes hayetzer the war against the evil inclination, the internal desire to not do God's will. So we have, like Tanya explains, the Alter Rebbe wrote Tanya, where Tanya explains about the shtei nefoshes, the two souls, the godly, altruistic drive and the animalistic, selfish drive. And they are at war, like it explains in chapter 9 of Tanya. It gives also there the metaphor of a war, of two kings fighting over a city, fighting a battle. And the battle is raging within each of us. Okay, so that's a familiar concept, that the service of Hashem is sometimes also called a war. So it's not hard to understand how an insight about actual war could be aligned with an insight about the spiritual war. Let's continue. This is a, a saying from King Solomon in his, in his wisdom. Shleima Melech, in the book of Kehelis, says, One opposite the other did God create. That's a basic Hasidic idea. I mean, it comes from Solomon. It comes from the Bible. But in Hasidic thought, it means that everything in the world is counterbalanced. Everything that exists in the realm of holiness has a counterpart in the realm of the profane. And that includes the inner dichotomy or schism within the heart of the human being. So he speaks about this in Tanya in chapter 6. In chapter 6 of Tanya, he says that the makeup of the animal soul is a mirror image of the makeup of the godly soul. They're almost like symmetrically opposed opposites. So, one opposite the other did God create. Watch how he explains it here. Just like there are holy emotions, love and awe and compassion. Next line. Or hisporus, or pride. Sometimes compassion and pride are both used to describe the middle emotion, the one that is a blend of love and awe. Hulu, etc. So just like there are three main emotions in the holy realm, meaning the love of God and the awe of God and the glorification of God, the desire to glorify God, those are um, holy emotions. So too... Cain, so too, yesh lumazeh, there is the opposite of that, ava besitra achra, love of profanity, 
which is tivus royim, bad desires and lusts, the chain beyira chulu, and so too with awe, being in awe of things other than Hashem, kowtowing and being afraid that people, places, and things can rule your life when really only Hashem directs your life. Okay, so come back to me. What he's describing here is some basic aveda. The word we use in Chassidus is aveda. Aveda means work, but it means inner work. This is basic aveda 101. You have two sets of desires, which are not only diametrically opposed in their agenda, the godly soul only wants to be one with God and surrender to God, and the animal soul only wants to protect its interests, or what it thinks are, is it, are, are is its interests. So not only are they diametrically opposed, but they have mirror image compositions. They're like, <laughs> those who know the Superman comics, like the bizarro version, right? You're nodding, you know what I'm talking about. So it's like, what is a soul after all? A soul is a proclivity or it's a drive. So a godly soul, it's driven toward God. And then there are a few different kinds of uh, ways that that drive expresses itself. So you have, a, you have an emotional palette but chiefly, you have three colors in the emotional palette, three color families in the emotional palette. You have love, which is the attraction toward something. And you have awe, which is shrinking away from it. And then you have tiferis, which is, we called it pride. Also, it's called compassion. Um, sometimes we call it compassion because love can be indiscriminate. I'm walking down the street and handing out $100 bills to everybody. And then... The opposite would be din, it's called yira, but it's also called din, which means judgment, where now I'm giving to nobody. Nobody's worthy. And then tiferis, which is a blend of those, is sometimes called rachmonis or compassion, because now I'm walking down the street and I'm giving out $100 bills to somebody who looks like he needs it. So I'm making a judgment, like the left side, din and gvura, but I'm giving, like the right side, like chesed. So it's a blend of both of those. And in Avedis Hashem, in the service of a God, one of the ex ways we express Rachmonis is like he says in chapter 45 of Tanya, to have compassion on the plight of your godly soul. Think about your poor little pristine princess. The soul is compared to a princess. And she left her father's castle, and she came down to this rough neighborhood. She came down to Brooklyn. And <laughs> you have to pamper her, and you have to make her comfortable. And it's a rachmonis that she's, uh, so yeah, you should have compassion on your godly soul. You know, when Bill Clinton was running for uh, president the first time, so during the primaries, he gave a speech in Borough Park. And obviously, he had a Jewish speechwriter. I don't know who wrote this line for him. But uh, <laughs> he had the Elam rolling in Borough Park. He came down and he said, do you want a president who has Rachmanis or do you want a president who is a Rachmanis? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, Bill, you know how he had a good way with words, you know. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so you have this godly soul and it has love of God, it has awe of God, it has compassion for God. That's the godly soul. And then you have this animal soul. And it's the opposite. It's got love of stuff other than God. <laughs> the things that it finds attractive and interesting and pleasurable. And it has awe, reverence for things other than God. You know, I'm afraid that... Uh, my boss doesn't like me, and I'm going to compromise my values in order to curry his favor. You know, that kind of stuff. That's, that's classic animal soul fear. And uh, it has tiferis of the animal soul. I don't know, maybe that's like having compassion in an inappropriate way. <laughs> Misplaced compassion, which is actually cruelty. At any rate, the point is, we have this dichotomy, and the dichotomy is very counterbalanced. And it's counterbalanced. Sounding familiar? Sounding familiar? 
we have this battle, these two sides, and they're counterbalanced right, left, and center. I mean, this is literally like the way that battles were fought during that time. So, it, I mean, it's not surprising that the Malach would say, hey, this stuff sounds kind of familiar. All right. So here's what he's going to explain. Let's, let's pull up the Xaviat again. Let's pull up the manuscript. Okay. So here's what he explains. Vihine Kidei lekafya lahapcho in order to subjugate, or even better, to win over, to transform the other side, to turn them into your allies. That's the ultimate. L'sitra achra. Now we're on the, def, that's the first word of, of this next line. L'sitra achra. L'choyra ha'ifen poshot. So seemingly, the obvious manner in which to do that, the no-brainer, how would you handle this conflict that is configured in exactly the manner that we just described? So he says, the oifen poshit, the obvious way to handle that would be that the handle for the axe comes from the tree of the forest that then comes back to the forest to chop down the tree. In other words, a taste of your own medicine. In other words, if you're going to come to me with Ava, I'll fight you with Ava. You come to me with Yira, I'll fight you with Yira. They call it fight fire with fire, right? So if my animal soul is provoking me with lusts and desires that are Ahava, that are love of the other side, I'm going to start shooting. That's called the right side, by the way. That's the right flank. So I know the attack is coming on my right flank. Right flank, fire back. And I'm going to shoot some godly love back in his direction. Counter him. Counter him. Okay? So that's the Eifen Pashat. That's the obvious way how to handle it. He says, Ayadei Avad if you're experiencing dysfunctional love, so arouse the holy love. If you'll arouse love for Hashem, you will throw down and you will subjugate the foreign loves. And so too, what do you think the next thing is going to say? Through holy awe, awe of Hashem, you will throw down the negative fears, the unwarranted fears of people, places, and things. Makes perfect sense. Chulu, etc. The who and this, this approach, which he already called the no-brainer approach, the obvious approach. It's like a war. Hulu, where each section fights the one opposite. Pull it up. Come back to me. There is a mimer from Reb Hillel Paracher. Reb Hillel was a chassid going back to the times of the Alter Rebbe, although he never met the Alter Rebbe. And he fills in some of the gaps here. Hillel Paracha explains it very clearly. There's a lot of stuff that we can understand better from, about this teaching from Hillel Paracha, which he heard presumably from the Tzemach Tzedek. He doesn't say he heard it directly from the Tzemach Tzedek, but that would make sense because Hillel Paracha had many, many interactions with the Tzemach Tzedek, and he would have been there in Lubavitch to have those interactions. So Hillel Paracher explains that the old way of fighting a war, pre-Frederick, is like the old approach called Musser. And he says, it's the Eifen Pashit. Actually, 
at first glance, it makes perfect sense. If your dysfunction is in the area of love, misplaced love, you're attracted to something that's no good for you. So the obvious approach would be, let me counteract that. Let me counterbalance it, and let me arouse some love of God. And if the dysfunction is in the area of, of, of yira, of awe, misplaced reverence, so let me counteract that, and I'll have some reverence of God. One-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano. <clears throat> he explains that Chassidus came along and said there's a better approach. There's a better approach. And it's not as obvious. You need to be more innovative. You need to be more of a creative strategist. But this is sort of what it means that <laughs> Frederick brought it into the world. And I, and I, and I want to mention something. I mean, pull, pull, up the, pull up the slide here. Chronologically speaking, obviously, Frederick's battle plan was in the time of the, the childhood or the adolescence of the Alter Rebbe. So we're talking about during the Nasius, during the leadership of the Magid. You can come back to me. We're not saying that before Frederick fought this way, nobody was able to do this spiritually. Because obviously, this goes back to the Balshamtev, who was a generation even earlier than the Magid. So the Baal Shem Tov was teaching this approach, and we didn't even say what the approach is, in case you think, oh, did I miss it? Was I checking my phone when he said, no. You, you were checking your phone, I saw you, but not when I said, because I didn't say yet what this approach even is. Although if you're smart, you could probably start to figure it out. And you know what it isn't. You know what it isn't, and you kind of know metaphorically what it is. Um, so obviously this existed going back to the times of the Baal Shem Tov. But... If I can take the liberty to interpret what does it mean that this was nishadish and it was nizgale, it was innovated and revealed milmaila from above al yidei through, through Frederick, maybe I could say that you know it was a concept that it existed in the world. I remember last year, hey Tavis, I was here. I think I was standing right here, and we we're talking about the Rebetzin, about Rebetzin Chayamushka, about her contribution to the the trial about the, the, the ownership of the library of, of a good Chassidic Chabad. And, and, and I mentioned here that, I don't want to get off topic, but I mentioned that you know, the Rebbe said about his wife, about the Rebbe, and one of the things she accomplished was that she was able to explain to the non-Jewish judge a very deep spiritual concept that caused him to rule in favor of a good Chassidic Chabad. So, and, 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 and the Rebbe said that that was similar to when the Alter Rebbe was in prison, that he was able to explain to his captors his position, and they were able to understand it. And that that was important, not just because of the favorable court decision, both in the times of the Alter Rebbe and in the times of the Rebbe Tzimchai Mushka, but it was also important because it was a certain beerer, to use the Kabbalistic term, a certain refinement in the world that a regular person, a non-Jewish judge, not using Kabbalistic arguments, but just listening to human reason, should conclude something that aligns with Kabbalistic logic. And, and, and maybe I could say, perhaps, that that's what it means over here, that, yeah, the Baal Shem Tov was teaching it, and the Magid was teaching it, but the fact that human intellect, came up with this idea and then put his money where his mouth is and carried it out on the battlefield, that that sort of made it more real, let's say, quote unquote. It made it more real in this world. Perhaps. Okay. So let's go back here to the manuscript. So we're saying the old way, and Hillel explains, the old way is the Musser way. And Hillel says it's the way of Musser. When you have a problem, just counteract it, fight fire with fire. Counteract it with the opposite, with the exact opposite. Just like they used to fight, <clears throat> right flank fights the right flank, the left flank fights the left flank, and the center fights the center. Okay, let's continue here. Um, here we are. 
where are we? Ach, okay. Ach be'emes. Ach be'emes. Ach be'emes. Ein ze maspik kol kach l'natzech melchomo. That is not enough to really win the battle. The old way of fighting is not enough to really win the battle. Ki haklipa misgaberes gamkein li'itim. Because now what are you going to do? You're going to actually provoke the bad guys. <laughs> you're going to make them mad. Now you're going to make them mad. You're going to provoke them. You're going to be ma'er of them. You're going to arouse them back at you. And here he quotes what it says about Yankov and Esav, about Jacob and Esau, where it says, that one nation will strengthen itself over the other nation. In other words, like a seesaw. There's pushback. It's counterbalanced. So when, <laughs> when you fight against the opposite, so what do they say in physics? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Hey, come, come back to me. Hilla Potitra explains this a little bit more. Again, it's not so filled out here in the Tamach Tzedek's manuscript, but <clears throat> Hilla Potitra explains a little more. He says, when you, let's say you analyze <clears throat> that you have a certain spiritual dysfunction. Let, let's just, for the sake of example, we'll say uh, an inappropriate desire or attraction. And you know, a, a foreign love, a love other than a love of God. And it's getting you really excited. So you say, oh, that's my problem. So let me counteract that with love of God. Well, he says, you already kind of lost. Because in order to even identify which side the attack is coming from, <laughs> you've actually just spent energy and focus thinking about the pathology, thinking about the sickness. And you're going to get, you're going to always get a little bit dirty. Hilipatacha says, when you start analyzing where is my dysfunction coming from, you're already getting too connected to it. The Alta Rebbe says something similar in Tanya. He says, when you wrestle with a dirty person, you're also going to get dirty. Even if you win. Even if you win, you're going to get dirty. So he says, in the old way, you had to analyze where the attack was coming from. But in the process of analyzing it, you get dirty. Manus Friedman once told me that he was a bacher in, in, in Yim Kippur. He was sitting in 770. And, and uh, the Mendel Futterfuss came in and he saw some guys. I don't know. He just started up with them. And <laughs> he was asking them, like, uh, what, what are they doing? And uh, I think he asked them if, you, if they're doing tshuva. <laughs> and, and, and so the Mendel asked them, he says, he says what's a tshuva? What, like, what, what's repentance? He says, he says, was in Tishrei. Then, then you think about, you think over all the Avedas you did in Chedish Cheshven. You go through the year. He says, you think, that's true. He says, and comes out, you spent the holiest day of the year wallowing in sin. So the, 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 the point is similar to that. It's like, if you have to analyze where the attack is coming from, you're already way too focused on the negativity, and it's going to rub off on you. Hill Potichar actually says, you're going to get yourself excited <laughs> in the wrong way <laughs> while you're doing it. You're going to be like, oh, I hate that thing. Oh, that thing, that thing. Yeah, I really, oh, yeah, I really hate that. Right? He says... It's, 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 it's an inherent risk. It's almost unavoidable. He says it is unavoidable. So, so, so that's, that's one problem. He says with the, old, with the old approach. Now what's the new approach? I mean, we know what it is. We know the metaphor on the battlefield. It's you take all your armies and gang them up on one army. But let, let, let's find out what that means. And again, we're going to use the, the Tamach Tzedek's holy handwriting, but we're going to fill it in with Reb Hillel's amplifications. Okay, so let, let's... Let's... Uh, Continue here inside. Um, Yisrael, you have the slide? Yeah? Okay. I'm, by the way, people here live, the slides, you can always see the slides, but uh, on YouTube, they can only see it when Yisrael turns them on. So, okay. Um, yeah. So he says that it counterbalances, it comes back. Hello. Hello. 
Shayiro Kol Gimel Midais Dikdusha. What should you rather do? What should you do? What should you do instead? What's the new style? Is that you arouse all three holy emotions: the love, the awe, and the compassion, the right, the left, and the center. You get it all worked up, all your emotions for God. Don't compartmentalize. Get all your godly emotions worked up. Lo'umas, next line. Mida echod de klipa. One, one of the negative emotions. And actually, if you're following Rabbi Hillel's Biur, you haven't even necessarily identified which. Is this still on? Did I turn this off? You haven't, you haven't even. The whole time? Because I didn't hear. What happens? You touch it once. It's working now. God forbid, I won't touch it again. Okay. <clears throat> I have a little more tea. When my tea gets cold, it means I've been talking too long. That's my tea is cold. Okay. So if you're following what Reb Hillel is saying, you haven't even necessarily identified where the attack is coming from, because it's not necessary now. Because you're going to have the same response to any attack. The old way, which he calls the Musser way, you have to know, is it dysfunctional love, is it dysfunctional awe, is it dysfunctional compassion, in order to have the appropriate counterattack. But in the new style, it doesn't even matter what the dysfunction is, because we're going to respond, we're going to, any attack is going to be responded with our entire army. Which means love, all compassion, all of it, the whole thing. So we're going to go against mida echod de klipa. This is like the third line from the bottom, first word mida echod de klipa. Vayidei ze bevada yapilo vyanotschoi soi. Then we are going to certainly throw it down, and we're going to be victorious. Vezehu kemashal. And this, metaphorically, is exactly like the Atakirin strategy of Frederick the Great. Chulu, etc. Kamekain. Achakach. Then afterwards, Yo'iru gimel midis de gdusha. Now, neged mida hashenis de klipa chulu. Ad kolaisam. You just go knock them down, all of them, one by one. He gathered all the flocks. Who? Yankiv Avinu, Jacob, gathered all the flocks. Why? Because the Oves, the fathers, are chesed gvura and tiferes. So Avram is chesed. And, and, and Yitzchok is gvura. And Yankiv is tiferes. So it's not explained over here so much, but uh, if, if you... Remember, uh, you can show the slide. I showed you that there's a mimer in Lukute Torah from the Alter Rebbe, Parshas Vaschanen. Over there, he explains it a little bit more. You can come back to me because you're not going to be able to read it that size. Anyways, but I'll just tell you outside. He explains over there, without going into the whole Frederick thing, he explains over there the occupational hazard of, of fighting with a concentrated attack of love or of awe. He says like this, Avram... Abraham was chesed, was kindness. The problem is, kindness has a, uh, a byproduct that's unwanted. It's called chesed de klippa, the uh, negative form of chesed. And that was Yishmael. Avram had a son, Yishmael. Yishmael was also chesed, but chesed de klippa. So he was into generosity, but uh, in a very invasive way type of way. Here, I have something to give to you, and if you don't want it, <laughs> you better want it. <laughs> Yitzchak is Gvura, and he was holy Gvura, but Gvura has a uh, Gvura de Klippa, a waste product that comes from it, and that was Esav. Esav was Gvura de Klippa, aggression. Esav was the hunter. He was very uh, pugnacious. He's always looking for a fight. So in holy terms, Yitzchok's gvura was self-discipline. 
self-containment. But in Klippa, the way it came out in Esav was, yeah, I'll be tough, but not on me, tough on you. <laughs> That's Gvoda de Klippa, right? But only Yankiv, who was Tiferes, Mitose Shlema, all of his sons, all 12 sons, followed in his ways. And that's because Tiferes doesn't have any unwanted byproduct. And he explains that in Aveda, this mimer in, in Lukut uh, ex explains that that's the beauty of Tiferes. And Tiferes here doesn't just mean Tiferes as, uh, to the exclusion of Chesed and Gvorah. It actually means Tiferes as it combines. Clearly, it means Tiferes as it combines within it, Chesed and Gvorah. It means like this. Throw everything that you've got. Because when you compartmentalize the approach, there's always going to be an unwanted byproduct. When you're fighting using your love, you're going to have an unwanted byproduct of love. Like, you're going to have, oh, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that to come up. I'll give you an example in Gvura. Um, it, it says sometimes when somebody will daven ba'veda, <laughs> if they'll daven with a lot of contemplation, concentration, that afterwards, they'll be ornery. They'll be cantankerous. They'll, 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 they'll be angry. And that doesn't make sense because you just daven so beautifully and now you're like in a foul mood. So it explains in Chassidus, yeah, because Ava, uh, because, uh, because Gvura, Gvura is um, when you're davening, it's a lot of Gvura, it's a lot of self-containment it's also you're, you're, you're striving upward like a flame, which is also which is, which is also uh, gvura. And what happens is after you're finished with, with your prayer, you have like, like this overflow of gvura, and it's not being channeled in prayer anymore, and it could come out like a negative byproduct. It could come out as being angry and grouchy. So the point is that love and awe meaning compartmentalized approaches, can have a negative byproduct. And he explains also there in that mimer, that's why Avraham dug wells, and they got plugged up. And then Yitzchak dug wells, but they also got plugged up. And Yankiv came along, and he unplugged the well. He unplugged the well, and he gathered all the flocks. And those two things go together. That when you have an approach where you take all of the emotions from the holy emotional palate, and you gather them all together without just picking one flank. You take all of them at the same time. So now there are no negative repercussions. No one's going to plug your well, so to speak. You're going to unplug the well. You're going to have success. So <laughs> what, what does this mean? Let, let's, let's finish off the, the, the manuscript. Okay, let's, let's go back inside. He says... You're always going to have, if you push with one compartment or one area, you're going to get that counter strike, that equal and opposite reaction, and you're going to end up with those unwanted byproducts. So he says, yeah, I said this. This is what it means. He gathered all the flocks. Shehem Ava Veyira Verachamim. Now we're on the last line. Dikdusha. You get all of the emotional attributes of the godly soul worked up. Oz Daika then specifically Vagalaluesa Evan Shal Pi Haber. Then you can remove the stone from on top of the well. Kishinisbor Lamaila, like it is explained above. Okay, so I'm going to use, come back to me, I'm going to use the words of Hillapadacha to fill this in. And maybe I'm going to add some of the words of, uh, of me. <laughs> I'm going to add some of my own words for 2021. Once upon a time, before Frederick, before Lahavdil Chsidis, It made sense to analyze and to diagnose exactly what's spiritually wrong with me. Because I have to know exactly my illness in order to know exactly the medicine, the antidote. But now we have something called holistic healing, where 
I don't treat symptoms. I strengthen the overall organism. That's not how Reb Hillel says it. That's how I'm saying it. But I think it's the same idea. Once upon a time, we treated symptoms. So I had to figure out where my animal soul was rearing its head, and I had to give it specific pushback in that area. Now we don't do that anymore. Now you know what we do? You know the new form of Avedis Hashem and Tikkun Hamidois? Tikkun Hamidois means rectification of the emotional attributes. You know how we fix our emotions today? Reb Hillel says, his button is clawless. Just think about God. Don't try to, oh, here's a, here's, a, here's a love maneuver, love back at you. Oh, there's an awe maneuver, awe right back at you. He says, don't do that. Just think about God. And don't even get so specific. Just think about God. So in 2021, this is what Hill says. So in 2021, by the way, I think it makes more sense today than even in, in those times. Because in those times, you had guys who would probably be annoyed. Like in the times of Frederick, you probably had soldiers who were pretty good at the old form of doing battle. And they're like, why do we need newfangled ways? So in the times of the Tzemach Tzedek, you had Oivdim who were like, why are you telling me to do it this new way? I can handle it the old way. I'm pretty good at it. And Chesidus is coming along and saying, listen to me. You don't have to become such an expert in your problems. <laughs> you don't have to become such an expert in your spiritual dysfunction. They all warrant the same exact response. No, 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 because if it's a love dysfunction, you counter it with love. No, 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 that's the old way. Frederick innovated things, baby. Now, <laughs> it doesn't matter what the dysfunction is, just Strengthen your general relationship with Hashem. If you have midas rois, in other words, you have midas rois. That means negative emotions, okay? So I'm experiencing a desire for something that's really, I know it's awful, I know it's wrong, okay? Or I'm living in awe, I'm living in fear and dread of something I know really has no power over me because I believe in God and I know that thing really no, has no power over me. And, and I realize I'm experiencing some emotional dysfunction. So I want, I want to zero in on it, and I want to counteract it. And, and, and Frederick the Great's plan comes along and says, listen, don't do that. You want to do Tikkun Amidus? Yeah, I want to Tikkun Amidus, yeah. Okay, go learn Shadar B'Tochen. <laughs> no Shadar B'Tochen from Jesus Elvavis, the gate of, uh, of trust. Yeah, but where does it talk about Havedas and, 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 and Midas Royce? I want to know, I want to do, I want to really, I want to zero in on the problem. Don't zero, don't zero in on the problem. Just learn Shara B'Tochen. Just learn how to trust Hashem more. Think about Ashkocha Protest. Think about divine, uh, divine providence. Just go think about God a little bit. In other words, <laughs> don't tell your, <laughs> don't tell God how big your spiritual dysfunctions are. Tell your spiritual dysfunctions how big God is. Think about the Abishter. I want to tell you something. Even in a case where you messed up and you actually did something, you, you crossed the line behaviorally, you did something wrong. Not just midas rois, which means you had a desire. But I mean you crossed the line and you did the wrong thing. You know what the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya and Perek Havav? He says, okay, fine, you feel guilty, fine, we're going to take care of it. So you're going to have to do a little bit of a moral inventory, and you're going to have to admit to yourself what you did, and admit before God what you did. He says, but even in that case, he tells you what to do. He says, first of all, don't do it all day long. You have to have itim mizumonim, you have to make an appointment. Usually at night, the end of the day, it's quiet, you do your moral inventory. But he says, even then, at your appointment, he says, what's the time set aside for? Lisbain and begdula Hashem asher chotoloi. To meditate upon the greatness of God against whom you have sinned. So important there. Not to meditate, not to meditate on your sin. Sometimes we think, what does it mean to do tshuva? <laughs> like Reb Mendel. Like <laughs> Reb Mendel Futtaf has his word about Yim Kippur. You spend all, all Yim Kippur thinking about Avedas, right? What do we think tshuva means? Oh, I did an Aveda. So let me think about how bad that Aveda was. Okay, it's almost like you're doing it twice. But now it's the slow motion replay. Ah, let me watch that one again, right? 
be misbeined by Gdulas Hashem Ashechotolei. Meditate upon the greatness of Hashem against whom you have sinned. In other words, it's almost irrelevant what the sin was. <laughs> it's not about the sin. It's not what you did. It's about against whom you did it. You know, it's not like, well, what, what did you do that made your wife upset? You forgot your anniversary or you, uh, you made fun of her mother? What does it matter? You offended your wife. Like, it's not about what you did. It's against who you did it to. So think more about your kesher with your wife. Think about more your relationship with your wife, and that'll clear up all the issues. You won't forget your anniversary, and you won't make fun of her mother. It clears up all issues. Like I said before, holistic healing. Holistic healing. So that's, that's Frederick the Great's battle plan. He says, don't stop and wonder where the attack is coming from. Don't identify, is this dysfunctional love? Is it dysfunctional awe? Is it dysfunctional compassion? We're going to respond to all attacks with one and the same general approach. Take all of your emotions and arouse them all for Hashem by thinking in general, not specific, in general about your relationship with Hashem. And when you have a more solid relationship with Hashem, automatically the Ava issues clear up, dysfunctional Ava, the dysfunctional Yira issues clear up, the dysfunctional Tiferes, Rachamim issues clear up. All the symptoms clear up. So stop thinking about Avedas and stop thinking about spiritual dysfunction and stop thinking about your shame and your guilt and everything that's broken about you. Stop. That's the old way they used to fight. Now just think about Hashem. Just get excited about your relationship with the infinite and how the infinite has chosen you for an intimate relationship. And if you think about that, automatically all the issues will disappear in such a clean, seamless way where you never had to wallow in it, you never had to get pulled into it, you stayed clean. You stayed above the fray. Take the high road. Take the high road. <sighs> Anyways. That's what the uh, Alter Rebbe told the Tzemach Tzedek on Friday, Erev Shabbos, before the Alter Rebbe's passing, the night following Shabbos, in the village of Piena in the winter of 1812 while fleeing from Napoleon. He shared with him a memory that was 50 years old. When I arrived in Mezric, my friend, my beloved study partner, my teacher, Reb Avram, the Malach, the son of the Magid, said to me, hey, you know that thing that just happened that the whole world is talking about? Yeah. That's our new way of serving Hashem. That's our new model. We don't think about negativity anymore. Not even to fix the problem. Not even to fix the problem because we got a better way of dealing with it. We think about God. We think about the solution. I'm not joking. If you have something inside of you that you're grappling with, something ugly, something dark, go learn Shara B'tachin. <laughs> go increase your, your trust in Hashem. Go think about you have a loving Father taking care of you. And I promise you, if you ever want to go back and analyze and get back into the, the dirt and see and check on how the dysfunction is going, I promise you, learn Shara B'tachin every day. And you come back a year later and tell me that you're not overall a more spiritually healthy person. That's what the Alter Rebbe was sharing with his beloved grandson. We've got a new battle plan. Make sense? Yeah? You gonna go do it? Anyone gonna do it? Zalman Meisha's gonna do it. Zalman Meisha's gonna leave it. Gonna do it. 
Okay, thank you.